This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. All right, I'm going to go through um, the first scenario in Section B of the September 2016 F5 exam, where, if you remember, in Section B, we've got three scenarios, each with five multiple choice questions. Uh, so I'm going to go to the first one, <coughs> which um, the question 16 to 20. Now here there's no choice but to have a quick look at this scenario first before we go, go to the questions. Milo runs a cafeteria situated on the ground floor of a large corporate office block. Each of the five floors of the building are occupied with a total of 1,240 employees. Milo sells lunches and snacks in the cafeteria. And it's fascinating all this, but still. The lunch menu is freshly prepared each morning. Milo has to decide how many meals to make each day. As the office block is in the city centre, there are several other places situated where staff can buy the lunch, so the level of demand for lunches is uncertain. So he's not sure how many lunches he's going to sell. Uh, because he prepares the meals each morning, he has to decide how many meals he's going to make. He's analysed daily sales over the previous six months and established four possible demand levels and their probabilities. And he's produced the payoff table to show the daily profits which could be earned. Now I've copied out the table here. Uh, and you can see at a glance what's coming. Um, Maximin approach, minimax regret approach. So make sure you are clear which way around the table is, because it could be drawn either way around. But here, what's uncertain is the demand. The demand can be any one of those four levels. And what he's having to make a decision on is how many meals to actually supply. Shall he supply 450 or 620 and so on? So this is what we're making the decision on. Which of those four choices, 456, 20, uh, is going to be the best one? Let's have a go. The first, question 16. If Milo adopts a maximin approach, which daily supply level will he choose? Uh, well, here, I mean, really, you should have learned the rule, and it should be no, uh, no question. Uh, for each choice, remember, you can ask them to supply 450, 620, 775, or 960. Uh, in each case, um, we look at the worst outcome, or the minimum, So if he supplies 450, uh, the outcome, well, it's going to be 1170, whatever happens. On the other hand, if he makes 620 meals, the worst outcome is a profit or a return, whatever it is, the payoff anyway, of 980. If he chooses 775, the worst outcome is 810. If he supplies 960, it's 740. So there's the worst outcome in each case. To decide which one he's going to choose, you pick the best of the worst or the maximum. Maximum uh, 1170. And therefore, he will go for 450 lunches, uh, 16. The answer is A. So if you've learned the rule, that's an easy one because you are given the table. Uh, just make sure um, that you have which way around it's drawn. You know, it could be either way. Sometimes uncertainty is along the top and the decision down the side. So think carefully, but it, it is clear enough here. Uh, 17. Now, this just takes a bit longer, I think, because they want mini max regret. So I'm making space and I don't have to go up and down too much. 17. But well, remember, with Minimax Regret, we need to rewrite the profit table in terms of regrets. So same basic table, 
Uh, the demand, 450, 620, 775, and 960. And the supply, what were the 450, 620, 775, 960. And do be careful here. People learn the rule, but sort of learn it wrong, not clear what they're doing. If minimax regret, you go to each uncertain amount in turn, and you say, okay, if the demand was 450, which would have been the best decision? Well, if demand was 450, maximum best profit would be 1170, uh, you'd have supplied 450. So had you supplied 450, there'd be no regret. If, though, you've supplied one of the other levels, you've less profit, you've got regret. So if you'd supplied 620, you'd have only got 980 as against 1170. The difference is 190, the regret, the loss. If you'd have supplied 775, you'd have only had 810, you could have had 1170. The difference is 360, the loss. And finally, if you'd supplied 960, you'd have got 740. You could have had 1170. The difference is 430. And the same for each of them. If demand turned out to be 620, the best course of action would have been to supply its profit. 620 and get 1612. So if you'd have supplied 620, no regret. What about the others? If you supplied 450, you only got 1170, it's against 1612. And so the regret, 442. 1395 is against 1612. 217. 1290 is against 1612. 322. Oh, we still what I'm doing, but remember, there's a whole lecture on this, so I shouldn't need to re-lecture it all. Uh, what if the demand was 775? Uh, the best would have been 2015, there'd have been no regret. The others compare with 2015, so 1170 and 2015, regret of 845. The next one, four oh three, and finally seventeen eighty five is against two oh one five, ah, two thirteen, and finally the last one. In fact, I should have a little bit because the first, oh no, it doesn't help. Sorry, uh, no, if it had been nine sixty. That would have been the best action to get 2496, no regret. The others compare with 2496, 2496 minus 1170, 1326, 2496 minus 1612, 884, 2496 minus 2015, 481. So there we are, there is our regret. Table. Uh, and how do we make the decision? Well, for each course of action, so the supply is either, oh dear, can't read my own writing, supply is either 450, 620, 775, 960. Uh, in each case, see the worst outcome, and the worst outcome, since these are regrets, is the maximum regret. So if you supply 450, the worst outcome is 1326. If you supply 620, the worst outcome is 884. 775, the worst outcome is 481. 960, the worst outcome is regret of 430. And to make the decision, which is the best of those, the best 
uh, is the smallest worst outcome of any one. So which is the number is that one? Minimum. Uh, which means we'd supply 960. And 960 is answer D. Now I think that's hard for two marks. I mean, all right, I'm taking longer because I'm talking, obviously, but even without talking, uh, that is a lot harder than 16, but it balances out. You know, although they're all two marks, some are uh, somewhat easier, some are, uh, are somewhat harder. Uh, what about the next one, then? <clears throat> On the same scenario, but here, actually, we don't need any numbers, do we? We could answer this independently. Which of the following statements is R true if Milo chooses to use expected values to assist in his decision-making? Expected values, we don't ask for numbers here, obviously. But, well, you obviously should be clear about expected values. We take the average, we multiply by the probabilities and base it on what you might call the average return for each course of action. One, Milo would be considered to be taking a defensive and conservative approach to a decision. No. No. Um, expected values is a risk-neutral approach. This is describing risk avoider, which would be uh, maximum or minimum regret. Uh, what about number two? Expected values will ignore any variability which could occur up across the range of possible outcomes. Yes. Expected values takes an average. It ignores the fact uh, that some outcomes might be a lot higher, some outcomes might be a lot lower. Number three. Expected values will not take into account the likelihood of the different outcomes. Ah, oh, I'm pausing here. Although I am going to carry on and read through them. Remember, you may be running out of time because question 17 took a long time. I know that number two there is correct. Look at the choices of answers. Number one isn't correct. Number two is correct. Think about it. The answer has to be B. It has to be. Anyway, I will carry on reading through three. Expected values will not take into account the likelihood of different outcomes occurring. Um, no. The likelihood of them occurring is the probability. Uh, when we work out the expected values, we multiply by the probability by uh, the outcome. And finally, four. It can be applied by Milo as he's evaluating a decision which occurs many times over. Uh, yes. Expected values, remember it's based on the average, but the actual outcome on any one day will be just one figure from that table. The outcome on any one day won't be the average, the expected. But since he's doing it every day, some days you get one figure, some days another. On average, he will get the expected value. So it is one of four. The answer is B. Over the page, 19. Human Resources has offered to undertake some research to help Milo predict the number of employees who will require lunch in the cafeteria each day. What's the most Milo will be prepared to pay for this information? Well, he's perfect knowledge. And in fact, I'll wind up because uh, we'll need the table figures. Uh, I don't want to waste your time writing it all out again. But this again, I, I think this is a challenge for two marks. I really do. Especially if you're having to look things out, for example. And remember, in the exam, you don't, you, you, your workings won't be looked at. So you can save a bit of time by uh, being less pretty. Um, with perfect knowledge, the first thing we have to do um, is see what the decision would be based on expected values without this information.
And so if we didn't have n, forget the perfect knowledge for the moment. If we're using expected values, then for each course of action, which is 450, 620, 775, and 960, we work out the average expected value. Now, of course, if we choose to go for 450, it's 1170 whatever happens, so no need to waste time there. On the other hand, going to the other extreme, if we went to 960, well, it's either 740, 1297, we multiply by the probabilities and add up. So at 960, it would be 740 times 0.15 plus 1290 times 0 0.3, 1785 times 0.4. Uh, and 2496 times 0.15, which is then speed on the calculator. And, you know, be efficient with your calculator, use um, brackets and things. But anyway, so you can all follow. 740 times 0.15 is 111. 1290 times 0 0.3 is 387. 1785 times 0.4 is 714, 2496 times 0.15 is 374.4. So the total, 111 plus 387, 714, 374.4. The expected value is 1586.4. So for 450, it's 1170. For 960, it's 1586.4. What about the other two? We can save a bit of time uh, in that, actually look at it. Here, have a look at this one. If we have the 620, um, it's 980 times 0 0.15, 1612 times 0 0.3 and so on. But think about it, multiply by the probabilities, 980 times 0.15. Instead of doing the other three individually, since you're multiplying by the same figure each time, 16, 12, you can save a few seconds by multiplying by the total probability, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.1, uh, 0.85. You know, because time is a problem here, obviously. So whenever you see a shortcut like that, take it. So 980 times 0.15 plus... 1620 times 0 0.85, it's 1524. And finally, for this bit of it, uh, what if we went uh, for 775? Well, 810 times 0.15 probability, uh, 1395 times 0.3 probability, and again, instead of doing the last two separately, why not do 2015 times the total 0.55 probability? And what does that come to? 810 times 0.15 plus 1395 times 0.3 plus 2015 times 0.55. I get 1648. Point two five, and I do hope my arithmetic's right. Those are the expected values, and therefore, uh, the one we choose, the one with the highest expected value, if we don't have perfect information, we will supply 620, and the expected return expected value, 1648. Point two five, But I'm afraid we're not there yet. I mean, I think that is worth two marks on its own. Uh, but we need to know how much we'd pay for perfect information. Now, this is actually very quick, but only if you're sure you know what you're doing. And if you're not, go back and watch the lecture where I go through perfect information. Um, with the information... Human resources go away, they find out what the demand will be. 
and they'll come back with one or four answers. So they'll tell us the demand will be either 450, 620, 775 or 960. And in the knowledge of what the demand is, we can decide what the best action would be. If they tell us it's 450, then what should we do? Well, the highest profit will be if we supply 450 and we'll get 1170. But they might come back and say 620. If they say 620, what will we do? If they say it's 620, uh, the highest profit will be if we supply 620 and we'll get 1612. What happens if they say 775? Well, the best profit would be if we supplied 775 and we'll get 2015. And finally, what if it's 960? Best profit would be if we supplied 960 and get 2496. And so we'll get back from human resources one of those four answers. Depending what they tell us, we know what we'll do and we know what the profit will be. But we could end up with any one of those four profits. What's the probability of those profits? It's the probability of demands being 450, etc. Which from the question, where have I put the question now? Here we are. 450, the probability is 0.15, 0.3, 0.4, 0.15. So the expected return, if we have this perfect information, 1170 times 0 0.15 is 175.5, 1612 times 0 0.3, 483.6, times 0 0.4 is 806. And 2496 times 0 0.15, 374.4. The expected value is therefore 1839.5. Now that's the expected value if we uh, pay for this information. If we didn't, the expected value is 1648.25. And so what does the question ask us? The maximum we're willing to pay, it's the difference. So 1648.25. The difference, the maximum to pay, the 191.25. Whew. It says to the nearest whole dollar. So, yes, the answer's A, 191. Now, again, that's an awful lot for two marks. It really is. You've got to watch your time very carefully in these scenario questions. Part A is easy. Uh, sorry, it's question 16 is easy. And uh, quick. Question 18, bit of reading, but otherwise that's quick. But you've got to be prepared to jump around. Uh, anyway, we have one more in this block, which is question 20. And this is actually completely separate. So whether you find the other four easy or hard, 20. Milo is now considering investing in a speciality coffee machine. He's estimated the following daily results from the machine. So in dollars, you've got the sales, the variable cost, the contribution, the fixed costs, and the profit. The following uh, statements, oh sorry, which of the following statements are true regarding the sensitivity of the investment? And so what do we mean by sensitivity? Uh, it's looking to see what percentage change in the various items would result 
in a profit of zero. And the lower the percentage, the less change is needed, the more sensitive we are. The investment is more sensitive to change in the sales volume than the sales price. Let's check it. Um, the sales price, if sales price changes, the sales revenue changes. And so we can afford a change of 385 on an existing revenue of 1300. 29.6%. If sales volume changes, then both revenue and variable costs will change. The contribution will change. And so we can afford a change of 385 on a contribution of 455. 84.6%. Well, remember, the lower the uh, figure, the more sensitive we are, the smaller change we can afford. So, in fact, sales volume is less sensitive than sales price. So, number one is wrong. Sales price is more sensitive, a smaller change uh, would result in a profit of zero. What about two? If variable costs increase by 44%, the investment will make a loss. That's extremely quick. Uh, if variable costs go up by 44%, 44% 44 of 845 is 371.8. Well, if variable costs go up by 371, profit goes down by 371, but since it's currently 385, there still will be a little profit. So we're not going to make a loss. It's still profitable even though we adjust. Uh, the investment centre to incidentally, I think I know the answer now. Look at the choices. Again, don't waste time. I mean, these five questions in total are very lengthy. But when you come to uh, question 20, I am confident that it's not one and two. The answer, therefore, has to be D. Anyway, I'll carry on and make sure we worry ourselves. Uh, sensitive to incremental fixed costs is 550%. Let's check. Uh, we can afford a change of 385 in the profit to get to zero on fixed costs of 70 in percentage terms. Yes. 550%. It is actually very meaningless. No, it isn't. Sorry, I do apologise. No, fixed costs obviously could increase. Uh, so that's true. And finally, four, the margin of safety um, is 84.6%. Uh, well, for margin of safety, we need to work out the break even. Uh, because margin of safety is the difference between our budgeted sales or revenue, 650 units, 1300, uh, and the break even sales of revenue. Well, for break even, we'd need a contribution in total equal to the fixed cost of 70. Uh, the contribution per unit, uh, at the moment, it's 455 in total for 650 units. So the contribution per unit is 70 cents. And therefore, break even units. To get a um, total contribution of 70, break even would have to be 100 units. Sorry, is 100 units? Uh, and so, what's it, at the moment, we're budgeting on 650. For margin of safety, we can afford the budget figure to fall by 550 units. So if it was in units, the answer would be 550. If it's in percentage terms, this is a percentage of the figure we're budgeting on, 650. 550 over 650, in percentage terms, is 84.6%. And so number four is correct. 
The answer is indeed three and four. The answer is D.